Thank you very much. With that, we will be taking your questions and we will start off with Reuters. Andrew Gray from Reuters, a question for all three of you. Um, how do you currently assess the state of the threat that Russia poses to NATO as an alliance? How much has it been degraded by the war, of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine and how much is it able to rebuild that uh, capacity even as the war continues? Thank you. Um, in terms of, uh, you have to look at it in two ways. There's, there's the different areas, of course, the, the different domains. I would say in the land domain, I, I, I would consider there's the biggest uh, uh, change over the last two, uh, two years. In the land domain, uh, you see not necessarily a quantitative change. Actually, the number of forces that have been going into Ukraine have increased over the last two and a half years. But qualitatively, it is going down in terms of the land domain. And that is both in their capabilities and in the personnel. Capabilities, because they lost a lot of m um, more modern capabilities in, in the war uh, with Ukraine. And in terms of personnel, uh, it is more people, but it is, it's less trained uh, people than, than when they started the, the war. That's in the land domain. And they lost a lot of uh, uh, tanks, uh, a lot of armored vehicles, they lost airplanes, they lost helicopters. So they, they lost a lot of equipment. They're now, some of the, uh, they are rebuilding, but most of the time it's older types they're rebuilding, or they're taking types out of uh, capabilities or equipment out of stock, which is most of the time also uh, older uh, equipment. So that is, that is in the land domain. In terms of the missile uh, capability, uh, over time, they have used, of course, a lot. They are producing again, uh, and that has increased. The production on, uh, on their missiles has increased over time uh, the last uh, two years. And unfortunately, they are now also getting, of course, missiles from, from uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, we expect them to get missiles from Iran, although we haven't seen them yet. Uh, and of course, they have received the drones from Iran uh, and the drone technology and that, are, that, they, uh, that they use to build the, 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 the Iranian drones in Russia. In terms of their air force, I think they have lost uh, a considerable number of aircraft, but still what, it, what remains is, is still a considerable force in fighter aircraft and helicopters. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, reconnaissance planes and, 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 and the works that makes up their Air Force. So I think uh, their Air Force is not untouched, but it is still very capable. And the same applies to their Navy and space and cyber, cyber capabilities. But so the, it is a diverse picture and they are uh, 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 most obviously are going to reconstitute, uh, but it is hampered by uh, the sanctions. It is hampered by money uh, issues, and it is hampered by their ability to produce enough, especially the more modern equipment. But they are doing uh, actually rather well in terms of their artillery production and uh, their older tanks. So I think that is, of course, concern, because uh, in the end, sometimes quantity becomes a quality in itself. Maybe, Chris, if you want to add. Uh, no. That, uh what Rob explained is, is exactly what I would have said. I would just add in terms of their reconstitution that they are sparing no effort uh, in their reconstitution. They are devoting an enormous uh, fraction of their budget to the military over the coming years, uh, next year specifically, and they are running their defense industrial base just as fast as they can right now. Those are important things to consider. Um, as, we, uh, as, as we study this question very closely. And in terms of workforce, they use uh, people from prisons. They use, uh, there is uh, indications that they might even use uh, uh, people from other nations. So um, that is, of course, uh, th it means it is a problem for them, and, but they are trying to find ways to solve that as well. I would just add one thing from uh, our perspective. The way we go is never underestimate and this is how we prepare and this is how we plan when it comes to capability, capability development and how we go into the future. Next question uh, here at the front, Ukraine. Yep. Uh, 
Vitaly Sizov, UA TV, Ukraine. Uh, my question to follow up the previous one. Uh, the German defense minister believes that uh, we must be prepared for the fact that Russia may attack some NATO countries over the next few years. How do you consider this threat and are you ready for such direct or hybrid threats? It's actually not new because uh, in our plans we describe, in our strategy and our plans, we describe two threats, which is Russia and the terrorist groups. So we look at Russia as a threat for NATO, and therefore the plans that we have developed and that have been approved in Vilnius are to counter the threat amongst that is Russia. So the fact that we have to be ready for an attack from Russia is not news in itself, because that is what our plans are for. We are a defensive alliance, and we should be ready, and we are ready, and, but we are improving to, to be readier with more people, with better capabilities in certain areas, uh, in terms of being ready for that possibility. Your question is my job. Yes, we're ready. AFP, and then uh, at the back. Thanks a lot. Uh, I guess for Admiral Bauer, for General Cavoli. Um, uh, on Ukraine specifically, you said that we shouldn't uh, be overly p pessimistic about this year. Do you think Ukraine is in a position to launch another major offensive this year? Or is this year more about reconstitution and rearmament for Ukraine and harassing Russia with long-range fire? And on the other flip side, follow on to my question, uh, the question from Reuters, is Russia capable of reconquering or conquering considerable territory in Ukraine this year? Thank you. Um, you know, war is a difficult thing. It's not, it's, not, it's not always a planable thing in the sense that you will always know and, and be able to predict what is going to happen. Because it involves two nations in this case, where uh, both nations make plans the Russians have basically not achieved any of their strategic objectives. That is important to say as well in terms of being uh, pessimistic on the Russian side. They have not achieved any of their strategic objectives. So they will most likely continue the fight, but they have some difficulties in finding uh, uh, the right uh, amounts of people and, and quality and, and ammunition as well. They have not been overly... Um, successful when it comes to their offensives against uh, Ukraine in the last couple of months. So there is back and forth at the front, but it's not that there is a, a big push and a successful push from the Russians. So both sides are now in a, in a phase where uh, it, it is not moving a lot forward one, one way or the other. And that is, that is what we see. Um, of course, uh, there, both sides will continue to make sure that they are, ha are having the upper hand, so to say, in terms of the initiative and the opportunities that they see, and then, and then seize them if, 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 if it is possible. But it requires personnel, it requires uh, the cap right capabilities, ammunition, and, and the personnel is not only the people, but also the right training. So all that is being done and, and is being worked on uh, with uh, with the with all the nations that work with the Ukraine uh, with Ukraine in in in, in this efforts as, as it has been in the last two years, um, so I, I don't think we should sort of expect a miracle happening on either side, but of course both nations will always look for opportunities, uh, and it will not be easy. And it and, and I don't expect any as I said miracles. Uh, so it is, it is going to be difficult. We need to continue to support Ukraine. I think that is the most important thing that all of us need to realize, because still, if the Russians leave Ukraine today, the war is over. If Ukraine stops the war today, they lost their country. So there is for them no alternative. They have to continue the fight. And uh, in order to find just a just peace, the Ukrainians want, of course, the most uh, uh, preferable p uh, position if at any stage a negotiation starts. Chris. You know, with regard to who's going to do what in the coming months, um, obviously it's dangerous business to make public predictions about an adversary's actions. Um, 
and uh, and and with regard to Ukraine's actions, it's it's very rarely the case that and a military is either preparing or operating. Those two things usually happen in parallel. Um, and I think we can expect to see that over the coming year. Um, Ukraine both generating force and, and employing the force. With regard to you know what they do with the force, well, you know all militaries either seize opportunities or create opportunities, and um, and and of course it would not be very wise to talk about what what those opportunities might be. Uh, next question in the back. Uh, yes, Victor Nemelin, Swedish news agency. Uh, in, in Sweden, there's been a big discussion about the government and uh, the chief of defense uh, uh, warning the people that uh, Sweden needs to be prepared for a situation like in Ukraine. Uh, was this something that you discussed, or this state of preparedness, or um, what's your view on that? And at the same time, uh, for the military planning, how frustrating is it to do the planning for the northern part with one country still not allowed in? Thank you. Well, we plan for the alliance, and uh, we prepare for new members, and that's the difference, I think. Uh, so we plan on, uh, on the 31 members. That's, the, that's what the plans are, uh, are based on, including uh, Finland. Uh, and of course, everything is in place militarily at the moment. To uh, Once uh, the political agreement is there and Sweden can join, or will join, then I think the military integration will be extremely fast, given the preparations on the Swedish side and the discussions between Sweden and NATO so far. So I think there is no issue there. They will uh, get uh, sort of fall into the fold very, very quickly in terms of the plans, uh, but they are not part of the plans at the moment because they're not a member. Uh, with regard to the, to the remarks of um, uh, General Biden, I think he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's very right. Um, uh, and, 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 and I said similar things, uh, meaning that we need to understand as a society that war and fighting is not only something of the military. I think a nation needs to understand that when it comes to a war, as we see in Ukraine, it is a whole of society event. And for many, many decades, we had this idea that we had the professional military and they would solve these security issues that we had in Afghanistan, in Iraq. But if you talk collective defense, it is a whole of society event. It will not be enough to have the present military. You will need more people from society to sustain the military in terms of people. You need the industry to have enough ammunition to, to produce new tanks, new ships, new aircraft, new artillery pieces. All that is part of this discussion of a whole of society uh, uh, event, and I think more people need to understand it's not just something of the armed forces and money. We need to be readier in, in, in across the whole spectrum. It's money, it's the military, it is being uh, ready to have, you have to have a system in place to find more people if it comes to a war, whether we like it or not. And then you talk mobilization, reservists, uh, conscription. I'm, I'm not saying it has to be one or the other system, but you have to think about this. You need to be able to fall back on an industrial base that is able to produce weapons and ammunition fast enough to be, able to, to, to be able to continue a conflict if you are in it. We're not seeking war as NATO, but we have to be ready for war. That is our job. Chris. Um, we don't get frustrated in the military. We just do. <laughs> um, we, as Rob said, are preparing for uh, Sweden's entry. Um, of course, not being a member, they're, they're not in the plans right now. Um, but geographically, they're right in the middle of part of the plans. So, of course, it's something that has to be prepared for in general. Um, we have also benefited greatly in this preparation from our history, operational, and training 
with Sweden. Um, we've had a partnership for many years, and our information exchanges um, at the appropriate level are extremely robust. So I, I have no concern whatsoever about how quickly we're going to be able to incorporate uh, Finland fully into the alliance when, um, when, when admitted. Uh, it will go very quickly and very smoothly. Thanks. To add on that, from a transformational aspect and when it comes to all the defense planning aspects, we are fully prepared because beforehand, before inauguration, you can do all those things, especially when we look at harmonization, standardization, interoperability aspects. All those things have been discussed. Uh, it's outlined what it means, and uh, Sweden, I can tell you, would be fully prepared to uh, join whenever it is the time to join. Okay, then we have time for one final question, Deutsche Welle. Thanks, sorry, Terry Schultz. Um, a bit of a follow-up on that, incorporating remarks that you made, um, uh, Admiral Bauer, uh, yesterday. Um, what's happening in Sweden is that people are going out and panic buying um, radios that don't need uh, electricity. They're buying tents. Um, people are signing up it, just in the last 10 days since we, uh, uh, the comments about prepare for war. They're signing up to the self-defense forces in, in a sense of, of sort of a feeling of insecurity. Do you think that it has reached that level? You said he was right to use these words, but that's how it's making people feel. Do you feel that Sweden is really in such a vulnerable position? And your remarks that NATO needs um, this transformation to... Uh, I'm looking here, what is it? Um, a war fighting transformation. This press conference is a carbon copy of the one, the one we could have had a year ago where you needed to be ready, you needed to transform. Why a year later are you still saying that this transformation is needed and hasn't taken place? And General Kavoli, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that as well. Terry, the big difference with a year ago, I would say, Terry, is that there's a lot of things that have happened in the armed forces and in the defense organizations. What hasn't happened is in our societies the understanding that it is more than the military that has to be able to, uh, uh, to, to operate in a conflict or in a war. It is the whole of society that will get involved whether we like it or not. That realization, we didn't talk about that much a year ago. If you look back the last year, what has happened in our alliance with regard to the battle groups that we set up. If you look back to the training, the fact that we now have a uh, steadfast defender with 90,000 troops, that is a record number. That is a record number of troops that we can bring to bear and have an exercise with in that size. Across the alliance, uh, across the ocean, from the US to Europe, in Europe, that is a big change. It's not a, it's not a carbon copy of a year ago. And so in the alliance and in the armed forces, a lot of things have happened. But the discussion is much wider. It is also the industrial base. It is also the people have to understand they play a role. They're part of the solution. Society is part of the solution. Industry, the private sector. Chris Badia talked about, the, uh, in terms of space, uh, the relationship with the, with the uh, civilian companies. That is all part of that thinking. And we need to sit down and make it possible together. It's not just a job of the armed forces. That's, that's my call that I was talking about yesterday. Uh, that is what uh, General Biden in Sweden is, is talking about. And the fact that people find it a surprise and as a result buy a radio on batteries, that is great. <laughs> it is part of, of, of the package that the, the Swedish government is, is talking about. You need to have water, you need to have uh, a, a, a radio on batteries, and you need to have a uh, uh, a flashlight on, on batteries to make sure that you can survive the first 36 hours. Things like that. That's simple things. But it starts there. The, the realization that not everything is planable, not everything is going to be honky-dory in the next 20 years. I'm not saying it is going wrong tomorrow, but we have to realize it's not a given that we are in peace. And that's why we have the plans. That's why we are preparing for a conflict with, uh, uh, with Russia and the terror groups. If it comes to it, if they attack us, we're not seeking any conflict. But if they attack us, we have to be ready. And maybe... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. In addition to that, one year ago, if you just see defense spending throughout all the nations, within one year, what the commitment is, how 
every nation really puts more money into that because they understand what it means for a from a transformational aspect, how to go forward, how we are tasked to look into new technologies, how we are tasked to cooperate to a much greater extent with the civil side, all those things. So it's not that we are buying more of the same stuff. Of course, we always could use more. But now it's really, how do we see all those synergies? Because if you see on human resource, there are, there are always limits somewhere. So the question is, how do we use what we have and how to develop into the future to a much better extent to stay on the edge? And if you look at that, and if you analyze it over the past 12 months, what has happened, what the commitment is from the different nations overall, and how closer we got to that, so there's a, a, a great change. You can see that. Yeah, Terry, I'm sorry if, uh, if we gave the impression that, that nothing's going on. Um, <laughs> so um, just a few examples inside Allied Command Operations, which, which is what I command. Um, we, we have completely reorganized my headquarters at SHAPE. Um, it is now organized in a war fighting fashion. It operates on an operational battle rhythm and sequence of events. And we've rehearsed that during a very intensive exercise early this year called Steadfast Jupiter, um, which incorporated not only my headquarters, but all of our subordinate headquarters, and very importantly, a number of national headquarters. Um, because of course, any plans we execute will have to interoperate with the nations where, where the operations would occur. Uh, this hasn't been done in a very, very long time. It's uh, very intensive to do that, and it requires a lot of adjustment. Uh, but it was necessary. It was necessary for us to be able to execute the plans, and I'm very uh, content with, with where it's going. We have completely reformed the way we do force sourcing, that is matching nations' forces against the plans. Um, the method we were using previously uh, could not be adapted appropriately to the new set of plans because of volume and the, the size of the requirement. Um, the way we've done it has made a multiples more forces in all domains available to the Alliance and, and readily available to be turned over to my command. Um, we have refined the plans at the tactical level, and that is an ongoing process. So when we, we, when we do the planning, we start at the strategic level, then go to the operation level and do the big muscle movements. But a lot of refinement has to be done at the tactical level. So all of our cores, nations where the cores operate, our joint force commands, um, and our uh, component commands under such as LANDCOM and AIRCOM are all working very hard to do um, refinement of the plans, which of course further informs our, our future efforts. And we're rehearsing those in tabletop exercises to, to find um, exactly the best way to refine them. Um, we are on the verge of announcing um, changes in our C2, in our command and control arrangements, that will put specific headquarters against specific parts of the plans for the first time in, in a long time. This will allow us to become very specifically oriented on areas and tasks that are necessary in the plans. Um, we are uh, coming very close to finishing approval of, of a new alert system, an alert system that will grant the appropriate authorities at the appropriate times on the road to a crisis so that we'll be able to move quickly and we'll be able to cover time, uh, cover distances in a relevant amount of time, which is a very important part of positioning a force for deterrence. Um, these are all huge, huge advances. And then, of course, we've been conducting uh, operations throughout the year under the authorities um, granted with the activation of our previous set of plans and under the principles of uh, DDA, De Deterrence and Defense of the Euro Atlantic Area, our strategy. Um, we have been able to put together defensive operations when necessary. We did one um, to defend the summit in Vilnius. We did one um, in Poland over the uh, over the past autumn at a sensitive time to make sure Poland's airspace was secure. And we're in the process of doing one called Southern Shield in Romania right now. All of these have been made possible by the uh, by the transformation, the alliance, to be able to move that quickly. Thank you all very much. That's all we have time for for this session. Uh, I want to remind everybody that the strategic foresight analysis, as mentioned by General Badia, is on the ACT website. And at the top of the stairs, we have a fact sheet about Steadfast Defender with a lot more facts and figures waiting for you. Thank you all so much for attending. Until next time. <laughs>